What's up, everyone, and welcome to the Long Game Podcast, hosted by Thomas Kopelman and Jacob Turner. In each episode, you'll hear us break down financial topics that are relevant to you and your situation. Our goal is to help bring credible financial information to you in short, bite-sized episodes. All opinions expressed on this show are for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. Nothing on the Long Game Podcast should be considered advice. Always consult with your team of professionals before making any decisions regarding your finances. All right. Hello and welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Long Game Podcast. I'm your co-host, Thomas Coldman, here with me, Jacob Turner. And we're taking a break from guests for the next couple episodes. So we really appreciate everybody listening. Sorry for last week. Um, the audio was not very good. That was not necessarily something that we were expecting. Um, you know, really good guy, does insurance well for our clients, but probably not the best for the podcast. So we actually deleted the second recording just because we wanted to give a better experience um, for you all. But I don't think it takes away from how important this insurance series is. I mean, Jacob, I'm sure that you can attest to this too, but like 90% of the people coming in to work with us who are high income, high net worth have terrible insurance coverages. And at the end of the day, like one of the first things I talk about with clients is the, the only thing that really can destroy your wealth right now is basically some huge expense and most of those are going to be something that insurance could protect against. So as much as people think that like the higher net worth you become, the less insurance matters, I actually think it's it's the opposite, right? I think when you're younger or when you're earlier on, you don't have a lot of wealth. Insurance is really about like, oh my gosh, well, if I get in a car accident and I have to pay 5K, I can't. So I need really low deductibles and I need to make sure that I can't be out of pocket much. But then on the flip side, when you become high income, especially high net worth, it's the opposite. You're not worried about low deductibles. You're not worried about $2,000 or $5,000 expenses. You're worried about a loss of life. You're worried about loss of income. You're worried about a car accident and being sued millions of dollars. And so insurances are really, really important. And that's why we started with auto. And in today's one, we're going to talk about homeowners. And before we get into it, Jacob, anything you, you think that we should add, you know, just kind of like the, the framing of insurance for high net worth people? Well, I think it's really relevant in today's society, right? We're recording this episode just the week after the big hurricane hit Florida, right? And you think about the devastation, not only in Florida, but in North Carolina. And it's not to be underestimated, like to your point, Thomas, I think a lot of the people that we work with, but just the general population, right? Like this is one of your highest valued assets, your home. And just because you have quote unquote homeowners protection or homeowners insurance does not mean that it's the same across the board. And that's what I'm excited to talk about today. It's just understanding the nuance of this, because this is something that before I started working in this seat as a financial advisor, frankly, I didn't quite understand it. I just thought, okay, I have homeowners insurance. It's all the same. And excited to talk Thomas about what we see with clients, the biggest differences we see between one versus another, and a lot of times the gaps that we try to help cover. Yeah, and I think you made an interesting point about kind of what's happening in the world. And I think what people have to realize is like, insurance does suck in a lot of ways, right? Like people hate insurance. Like the people who need flood insurance are pretty much priced out of the market, right? Like if you live in an area where you have a very high likelihood of some event happening, you're either not going to be able to get insurance for that or it's going to be really expensive. And I get it. Like, we're not sitting here saying we love the way that insurance has been created. You know, obviously we wish that you could pay $10 a month for flood insurance to cover your million dollar home, even though there's a high likelihood. And if you look statistically, it's less than 1% of people who are affected by the hurricane had flood insurance. And so I think a lot of times people see that and they're like, well, then why don't they have it? It's a price issue. It really is. And, you know, totally get that that's a hard part, but what we're going to focus on today is like the areas that you can control, the areas that you need to focus on. And, um, you know, one other note is that it's expensive in certain areas across the world, right? Like I have a client right now who's like, I live in California. I'm thinking about moving to North or South Carolina. Like I want to make sure that we actually look at the increase in homeowners insurance. It's really not going to be much different. It's going to be really expensive in both of those places. Really. If you look at Texas, certain areas, Florida, California, North and South Carolina, they're really expensive places for homeowners insurance. And that's just the reality of it. I don't think it changes whether you should have it or not. One of my clients in Texas last year thought about this. He was like, hey, just based on the cost of this, like, I just don't know if I should have it anymore. And so we ran his financial plan and said, if you had to rebuild your million dollar house, you would have to go back to work. And, but if you increase your expenses by 6K a year, no difference on your long-term plan, right? And that shows 
how important it is to have that health insurance. I mean, not many people's financial plans, unless you're extremely wealthy, can handle an entire rebuild of your house and what that would take out from your portfolio. But anything you well, want to add there? What I was just going to say, let's just start with understanding, like, what are what should people be actually looking at when they look at their potential homeowner's insurance? Because I think that's the biggest thing is people think, oh, I have homeowner's insurance, it must all be the same. And I think, you know, the most common thing to look at right, at the, right off the bat is the dwelling coverage. But before we even talk through, like, what the different nuances are in terms of your property and casualty declaration pages is what we call them. Just understand that the value that you get from your homeowner's policy matters far more than what the bottom line cost is. And I think one of the things that a lot of people miss is they see whatever the bottom line cost is, and then they go back and they say, okay, well, I was either paying more or less money last year or before this new proposal. So I should just go with whatever costs the less, the least amount. And that's just not true, especially in today's environment. You need to really understand what is the what is in the actual document itself. And as I look at, I've actually had my own homeowner's policy pulled up right here. As I look at it, we have dwelling, other structures, personal property, and loss of use. So like these are the four most common things you're going to see on there. And I think it's really important to understand, you know, you need to understand what you're getting in terms of even the dwelling coverage. Like I like to always say, like, ask the insurance agent, if my house burns down tomorrow, burns all the way to the, down to the ground, what are my options? Like, how much money could I get? What does it look like? If I wanted to walk away, would you write me a check for it? Because I think oftentimes we see these documents and if you're not working with somebody like Thomas or myself, you might not really understand what they're saying. And that's where I think it's really important to make sure that you're asking whatever professional you're working with, whether it's your financial advisor that's helping you with this, whether it's your property and casualty agent that's helping you with this. Let's talk in real life scenarios. If X, Y, Z happens, what does this thing mean for me? And that's really how you should view all risks, right? That it, it, outside of insurance, it's still like, if this happened, what happens, right? And you know, perfect example, people are like, well, I don't want to put my money into a Roth IRA or Roth 401k because what if X, Y, and Z happens and I can't touch it? It's like, great, well, let's follow this thought, okay? If it doesn't happen, what would happen? Okay, well, we'd pull from our emergency fund, okay? What if we need more funds than that? Okay, we have a taxable investment account, okay? What if we couldn't do that? Okay, well, we can reimburse ourselves from our HSA for past health expenses. And so a lot of times going through this train of thought is actually really, really helpful. And I think you're right. Dwelling is the is the best first place to um, start. And, and dwelling is really like, hey, if you know your house went down, what would be the cost to rebuild? And I think sometimes people see the amount they have and they're like, my house is worth a million dollars. Why does it say 700,000? And the reason for this is because of land, right? You don't have to rebuy back the land. Sure, there could be some damage and some you know fixing up that needs to be done there. But in general, it's what would it cost to rebuild my house where I live? That's dwelling coverage. And this is the first thing that you want to make sure is right. Because a lot of times you'll find people have just re up their policies over the last five, 10, 15 years. And the cost to rebuild their house might be two or three X more, just inflation, you know, cost of rebuilding wood, et cetera. Like it is going to be, it's going to be a lot more expensive than it was. So I would say this is something every one to two years that you do want to take a look at and quick caveat your dwelling coverage is not going to help you for, against earthquakes or flooding or damage from insects, faulty maintenance. Like those are reasons that are not going to get approved. And again, flood is that one that people don't really know about. They think that if that happens, that they're covered. Yeah. So let's talk about how do we get the right dwelling coverage? Because Thomas, you're, I think to your point, a lot of times we see the wrong coverage, either a client has just continued to renew forever and they don't quite realize that their coverage is wrong or they frankly they've never really taken a look at it to understand okay if i did my house burn to the ground what would it cost to rebuild it you know with a lot of high net worth carriers out there okay if you're working with a sort of private insurance company think of chubb aig peer some of these high net worth carriers they will actually send somebody out to your house to take a look at what you have inside your house and give you an estimate on what the cost to rebuild that is and here's why i think that's really valuable if you look at the outside of three houses and they're all in a really nice subdivision, you might say, hey, those all look relatively similar. But the reality is one of those houses might cost a million and one of those houses might cost three million. You might have super fancy marble countertops and you're like, I paid a fortune for these and I want to make sure that like I can replace these same countertops if something were to happen. And somebody else might have 20 year old granite in their house. OK, so I think it's really important to understand if you have a house that you've put a lot of money into and you have a lot of cool features, so to speak, in this house. I would really recommend to make sure that you have your insurance company come out and actually just walk through the house and give you an actual estimate based on what they see in the house in terms of what the cost to potentially rebuild that house is. 
I personally don't believe there's an accurate way for an insurance company to be able to plug your house into a system and give you a truly accurate result. Now, I think you can get close to it. I think you can ballpark it. But again, I'm talking about somebody that might have a really high-end home, has put really high-end features into this, and they just want to make sure they're covered. Because I think, Thomas, to your point at the beginning of this, with risk, especially for the clients that we're working with, we're trying to avoid the boat sinkers, all right? Like they've won the financial game. So how can we avoid the boat sinkers in this situation? A boat sinker would be, I have a million dollars worth of coverage, but it actually costs two and a half million to rebuild my house and it burned to the ground. Yeah, really good point. Um, okay, so that's the main one. The next one's other structures. So this is just like different things around your house. That could, this could be like a detached garage. It could be a swimming pool. It could be utility sheds, playground equipment, just different things like that. So like, you know, for some people, this might be really important, right? Like I, I grew up and one of my friends had like this really cool barn that was a completed basketball court and had like a gym, right? Like that's pretty expensive to build. You want to make sure uh, that is covered for a lot of people. If you just have a main house, like maybe this is less important, but again, this is something that you want to make sure you kind of check the box on. Um, I don't think there's anything else to add on that one. No, you're going to see other structures as, as pretty common on there. And what I would say is the other structures, the limit that you're going to get on other structures is almost always going to be tied into what the actual total cost of replacement is. So the idea is if I can nail the total cost of replacement in that situation we talked about, have somebody come out, the other structures should be able to follow suit with that. Now, again, if you live on a property and you have a big fancy barn, that's not really a barn, but like inside you've decked it out with everything and it's essentially a house. You need to make sure that you're telling somebody, hey, I know it says barn on here, but this barn is actually essentially another property, another house that I own. So again, just going back to understanding, okay, does my property have special features that like when I plug it into this software system for the insurance company that they're not going to be able to know about? Because if they do, I would just, again, recommend like have them come out, take a look at it. It's going to be free to do that. Okay. Like they want your business and they want to give you an accurate estimate estimation of what they think the cost to rebuild it might be. Good point. Really good point. Um, okay. So next one's going to be personal property, right? So this is just kind of, you know, what is everything that you have inside? And you were talking earlier about like, oh, it's, you might have a ton of stuff that's expensive. And what that one was really more so about is like, you know, the fixtures and the things that are, you know, are built inside. This is more so going to look at like artwork and jewelry and collectibles and, you know, TV is kind of like everything that you have in the house that you paid for separately. And this is one that, again, pretty hard to estimate, but you want to, you want to do it right. Like you, again, you might have somebody come out or you want to think about all the money that you spent really important to do this. And then like, what we always recommend is like one time a year, walk around your house and film all of it, because you might say you have $500,000 worth of stuff in there, but if you don't have receipts or proof of it, you're probably going to end up getting less money than if you actually had copies of everything that was inside of your house. Yeah. I think this goes back to like your specific situation. Um, I lived in Miami once upon a time and I can remember walking around this uh, mall down there and there was like a $50,000 glass vase. Like this glass vase literally fit flowers. And I couldn't believe that somebody would pay $50,000 for it, but somebody obviously will. If you are somebody that has $50,000 glass vases or something like that in your house, you really need to make sure you're documenting it. Yeah. If you're like, myself and you just have normal furniture in your house, you might not have to document every single thing. But again, if you go out and you buy a super expensive couch, you have this really nice piece of artwork, whatever it may be, you need to make sure that you have documentation of it. All right. So again, this goes back to another point that I make a lot is like, just be careful adding a bunch of complexity to your life because the more complexity you add, the more things you're actually going to have to do to maintain that complexity. True. True. Okay. So Next one is loss of use. So this is basically like, hey, if something happens and you have to be out of your house and you need to stay somewhere else is probably the best way to look at it. It could be at a hotel, you know, it could be, you know, additional expenses, even just like food, housing, transportation, et cetera. You know, whatever normal ones those are, you're going to have something on your insurance to cover it. And like, again, if your house went completely down and you're not going to be able to live in there for one to two years, super important. If it's, some other reason and you're out for a month or two, maybe that's not as big of a hit on cash flow. But either way, this is something that you want to think through. This is probably one you're not going to be able to pick. Like that they're probably going to estimate this for you because kind of an unknown, but something that you definitely want to have on your policy. Yeah. And depending on the policy, I mean, it can essentially be an unlimited amount. Um, my policy actually says actual loss. So in terms of like whatever the cost is, like they're going to do it to actually get it corrected. 
But again, I think this is where it's important. You want to make sure that you're talking to whoever the professional is that's helping you with this and just walk through like a specific situation. If my house burns to the ground and I have to go stay at the Holiday Inn for two months, what does that mean? And am I covered? If I, if you're in my situation and you have a bunch of young kids and you don't want to stay at the Holiday Inn for two months and you're going to go out and rent another house and it's going to cost a few thousand dollars a month to do that, yeah. is this covered? Is this not covered? Because again, just like anything with financial planning, like let's talk in real life terms, like this document is going to be full of Greek in your opinion. And you want to understand like, how do I take what's on this document and understand what it means for me in my own life? Yep, absolutely. Okay, last two, probably most important parts. There's other like small things like, you know, sump pump and all like, you want to make sure that if your basement gets flooded, it's covered. Like you want to service utility line for if any of the lines underneath. But the, the last two that are most important, and this one's probably the most important is personal liability. So personal liability is like, did anything happen on your property that you're legally responsible for. This could be, you know, you have your kid's birthday party and a kid slips and falls and, you know, you get sued. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things that could happen and it potentially isn't even things that happen at your house. Like, you know, I had one of these up and it was like, the example was Joe's sued by a guy he injured after tackling and punching him at pickup basketball and the injuries from this accident are not accidental. So those would not be covered, right? Like, I think people sometimes think like, oh, if I had some legal battle or like something where I criminally did something, this will cover you. That's not the case, right? Like, but if there's things that accidentally happen, it will. And so typically, you know, the max is about 500,000. You can get kind of like a little umbrella policy that sits just on top of there for added liability. But generally, 500,000 is the amount that I would say pretty much everybody wants. If you're going lower than that, you're taking a big risk because anything above that is going to come out of pocket. A lot of places you only need 300,000 to get covered for umbrella, but I still try to have people get 500,000 for the other added liability coverage when possible. Yeah. And that's one thing that we're going to be talking about in a future episode is umbrella coverage, but it's important to understand like, what is my total liability coverage between my homeowner's policy and any other sorts of policies that I have? Yep. Exactly. And then last one, super quick, is just medical payment. So this is basically like, hey, if there's any injuries or, you know, again, somebody trips and falls, you know, this would help be able to pay that out. Typically, you know, I think the max I often see is like 10,000. Is that typically what you see as well? Yeah, I think, you know, the other two quick points I would add outside of medical is, again, going back to real life, like what are the, what's the realistic scenario that your house burns down? Probably pretty low. What's the realistic scenario that your house is in a hurricane? You know, if you're down on the coast, probably pretty low. But so what could happen? I live in St. Louis. We have a lot of hail. That means a lot of times there's roof damage. Okay, so understanding like if this happens, what happens to my roof? How does that get replaced? This is a situation that I had recently this year where my roof got replaced, but I had the right coverage. And I remember the estimator saying, hey, but there's a lot of people that are not understanding what their roof policy says, because if the roof costs $30,000, it's been depreciated over time and we're only going to give you 7,500 for your roof and you're going to have to come out of pocket for the other amount. The other thing I would say, and Thomas, you mentioned it, is water and sewer backup. We have basements in Missouri and with a lot of basements, if there's flooding in it, it's going to cost a lot more money to get that fixed and get it back to the way that you want it than you think. You got to get all the water out of there. You're probably going to have to replace drywall. You're probably going to have to replace furniture. So these are little coverages, but in terms of how often they happen, you need to understand what happens in that scenario if I have XYZ coverage on my plan. And the last thing I would add, um, Thomas, on this is just understanding what your deductible is. If you are in a situation where your cash flow is really good and you're saying, hey, if a big claim comes, I want to make sure I'm covered for the boat sinker. But if something small happens around the house and it's 2000 bucks, I'm just going to fix it myself. Okay. I think it's really important to understand this. I have a $10,000 deductible on my house. That just means that like, if something happens that's under $10,000, I'm going to come out of pocket and pay for it. So really what I'm trying to avoid is like the big catastrophe, like the the roof blows off the house and it's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars to fix. I want to make sure I'm covered in that situation. But I think this is one thing that goes back to your specific situation and goes back to what we always talk about, Thomas, with planning. Like you have to do the planning first to understand what your taxes are, what your cash flow is. And if your cash flow is good, maybe your deductible is a little bit higher. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And that's what like we went, one of the ones we review with all of our clients, a lot of times you're like, oh my gosh, what's it going to cost to get all this coverage? And a lot of times we move that deductible from 500 to 25 if they're kind of in this middle age of life, 10,000 if they're farther along. You raise deductibles on auto, you get liabilities maxed out, you add umbrella, and typically we end up finding clients pay less on a yearly basis with a better optimized structure that is more in line with 
who they are and what they need to be covered. And I think a lot of times that's surprising, right? You don't have to have the gold standard of every part, right? You want the gold standard of the parts that actually matter to you and cut on the areas like deductibles, like you just said, which is actually for most policies, the most expensive part is the lower deductible you have. Why? Because you're going to have more things that happen that you're going to run insurance through. Um, so perfect. I think that's everything that we wanted to cover in this episode. So again, we went through auto insurance in episode one. This one is homeowners. We're going to have a quick one next week on umbrella, and then we're going to get into life and disability insurances. So again, everybody, thank you for listening. Um, you know, please go take a moment and rate and subscribe. Um, and if you have any ideas, let us know, but we'll see you back next week. Thank you.